Hello YouTube and welcome back to the zone where today guys we're going to be doing another Chris Chan article. This one is on Chris and business i.e. wanted to try and o open the negotiations to which he can make money through visibly doing as little as humanly possible. And I might open this up like later on but just again I want to re refer you guys to his Patreon. And of how little he you you actually get for what he uh, is offering. So let's uh, get started. That is not my fault the frame got broken transaction. The envelope was clearly marked fragile and handled with care. And it was shipped well in bubble in a bubble envelope. Either you being trollish or the postal carriers are to blame for the frame's arriving condition. An example of Chris's customer service skills. <laughs> Chris launched an online business in June 2014, selling customer arts and crafts through eBay. A year later, he moved shop to Etsy under a brand titled Quickville Shopping. He also began selling printed copies of Solitude on Lulu. He held a steady stream of customers despite issues with production and sending orders on time. For a while, he had achieved his dream of selling his own Sonichu merchandise and was making plenty of money. However, exactly two years and one week after the start of the business, so that's about uh, 105 weeks, on the 8th of June 2016, Chris's infamous laziness caught up to him. Don't exactly... It, I, I can only assume this was a stroke of laziness because if he was actually doing well for those two years, then... Uh, well, given what we've done about Chris and money, he will literally blow the money as soon as he gets wins of it. Chris's infamous lasers caught up to him, and he was banned from Etsy for ignoring orders over a span of months, beginning from when he bought a PlayStation 4. He did not take responsibility for the self-inflicted failure of his business. Instead, he lied to save face and cast blame on Lulu's.com staff for having stressed him out by labelling Sonichu as fanfiction and banning his account half a year beforehand in December 2016, even though he had actually ban evaded by opening a private account and was back to offering books through Lulu services only weeks later. After the Etsy ban, Chris fell back on begging and paid video requests to cover Bob's credit card bills and his expensive toy purchases. In May 2017, he felt like returning to work on the Sonichute comic. He felt like returning, isn't that sweet? And throughout the next several months, began to rebuild his business using Patreon, Lulu and Redbubble and accepting interviews for money. List of ventures by type, storefronts, main articles, eBay and Etsy. On the 1st of June 2014, Chris began cashing in on his internet infamy by offering custom artwork for sale. He... Oh, excuse me, guys. He later expanded his sales to include autographed photos, medallions, custom amiibos and personal items related to Chris III. This would be his most profitable and otherwise his most important commercial endeavor. Over the years, he would earn thousands of dollars by selling off Sarchu themed memorabilia and sundries. The largest financial contributions were often made by aspiring weens to establish contact with Chris and put themselves in a friendly position to earn his trust, negotiate, and then, boom, deceive him. He would not always fulfill his orders, that's probably why. However, and after receiving an abysmal 85% satisfaction rating through customer reviews, his merchant account was suspended on the 16th of June 2019. Proposals to uh, circ circumvent uh, the ban through a partnership with Jacob Sockness were never implemented. <laughs> that's great. On the 2nd of September 2015, Chris expanded his online business to Etsy. He continued the same offerings from eBay and added an, an, a, an added a donation listing for the continuation of the Sonichu series. Days later, on the 5th of September, a YouTuber named DS Tex donated $1,000 thinking that Chris would deliver 100 pages of Sonichu. Instead, Chris completed 16 pages before dropping the project. You know what? 
Is there any way you could take Chris over to court over something like that? I genuinely feel as if, like, well, unless, of course, the problem is, is that usually in the in those sort of things, there is no, uh, con unless there was a, a specific contract on those sort of things, uh, I'm pretty sure you couldn't get take somebody to court over this. However, I am more than, I could be more than satisfied in saying that this does violate Patreon's terms of services in some way. This move remains controversial with Christorians, as while some believe that he honestly wanted Sonic 11 to continue, others argue that this weenish move validated begging in Chris's eyes, as seen with the influx of begging videos in the financial tube crisis. In addition to DS text, dozens of fans have also donated. Chris simply claimed that he was too stressed to continue Sonic number 11. Bullshit, Chris. If somebody offered me £1,000 uh, to not only finish the remaining 200 odd pages of, my, of the first draft of my very first novel, and then told me to complete the rest of the series, which I believe there's going to be like about five or so uh, books in the series, I 100%, I wouldn't even hang about. I would be like that. You are you telling me Chris is so preoccupied with work or look care or cleaning his house or anything like that to not spend his time, you know, on what people pay him to do? However, Chris still had passion for making custom amiibos for several months afterwards. He took it seriously enough that he was willing to drive hundreds of miles through Virginia just to buy parts for amiibos to sell on Etsy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens when you give money to somebody who doesn't care for it. Or has done literally nothing to earn it. Or somebody who has a reputation for, you know, taking so much money, wasting it, and they're not willing to invest your time on making your pr product any better for anyone. He wasted hundreds of dollars buying up amiibos on eBay thinking that the market for his custom figurines would sustain itself indefinitely. This was not the case, and Chris eventually grew apathetic and bored with earning his own money. To complicate things further, Chris purchased a PS4 in March 2016. The new life upgrade proved too distracting, and he ignored Etsy orders. Often for months, and ultimately, Etsy took notice and banned his store for doing, for, from doing business. Although what's quite funny about this is that I actually bought a PS4 literally about five or so months after uh, Chris bought his. That's just, I I think I bought mine either it was either in July, I was either in August or or July or something like that. I still have it. It's it is, guys, it's a beautiful machine. I'm not I'm I'm actually not going to lie. The PS4 is a beautiful beautiful machine, but in terms of like you know going. In, in terms of not giving people what you want uh, for what they're worth, I would say that's a pretty big no-no in the grand scheme of things. Self-publishing. Chris took over a decade to try and any self-publishing channels. Clyde Cash beat him to the punch by posting Chris's comics on lulu.com. Chris simply retorted by encouraging his fans not to buy them and to simply wait for him to release the real versions later. According to emails from 2010, Chris claimed that he was working on fixing up his pages to be published on Lulu, taking up, taking an unreasonable amount of time to accomplish this amazingly simple task, and he eventually dropped the project. Undurated, Chris began selling printed copies of the Sonichute comic on Lulu in September 2015, as well as offering autograph versions through Etsy, by ordering the comics from Lulu, signing them, then shipping to the buyers. In December 2015, Chris was banned from Lulu for selling fanfiction. In true Chris fashion, he responded by threatening Lulu's uh, executives with physical violence. Yeah, that's exactly what you want to do when you want to keep your uh, in, in best interests open. You threaten people. That's all you got to do. Despite the fact that he was on probation for an act of violence against a GameStop employee, Chris was unable to continue selling comics in January 2016, probably rejoining Lulu under an alternate, alternate account. 
He was discovered within a few months and again his account was shut down. Deprived of other reliable avenues, aside from getting a proper job, like I said, he could have used his, folk his, his car as a courier service, but... Chris was has torpedily sought other ways to sell his own works. He opened a shop on Redbubble, an online shopping company where users could sell custom printed items based on images on the seller's choice. I've actually, you know what guys, I'm going to pause uh, for a little bit of a second here because I've actually, for the longest time, I've also wanted to be doing that, but... I would first actually have to like put my stuff on Instagram or on my uh, other platforms simply just to show if there's anybody out there who has an interest in that sort of thing because there's no point in trying to put all that stuff on there and putting all so much time unless people actually wanted them. That's the thing you got to realize. On the 3rd of October 2017, selling pictures of himself pre-Tom Girl and drawings of himself on framed pictures, pillows and mini skirts among others. Much later, on the 23rd of November 2019, the spiritual successor to Chris's Etsy opened as a new website of the name QuickvilleShopping.com. Here, Chris would offer his handmade trading cards for a My Little Pony themed game at extreme prices. Uh, yeah, exactly. Let's just, uh, let's, let's just take a look at those. Let's see, uh, the business. Let's see, uh, Chris's uh, self-run business. Uh, if we can actually, uh, Get to his shop or not. Uh, my site, uh, okay. This is like one of those sort of sites where you can literally just... This is, I, I know, this is like, he must have like used Wix or something like that. That's, that's just, I want to show you some of these. Uh, this is what you get, ladies and gentlemen. Featured products. Sonichu uh, bundle issue 0 to 13 uh, for anything between 275 to $300 for 14 comics. Uh, TSSF uh, Sonichu box bundle, 220 to $330 for all of these. For basically terrible artwork, pretty much. Uh, I'm going to like get to this one in a second. Uh, Sonichu and Rose Chew expansion pack, 25 to $470. Just, I want to show you some guys something. Uh, these are the photos he took. Uh, bulk deal with tuck boxes times 20. If you do that, you are going to buy, waste $470. Then there's 480 for the, uh, the Nightstar expansion. Then there's 480 for the Night V Warriors extension. And just the con listen, I just gotta show you guys something very quickly again. Because I know he did some of the artwork with him and somebody called Night V, MKR Night V. This is a uh, MKR V's uh artwork right here, which is it's it's based on another character entirely, so uh this is virtually useless. In fact, just about everything is sort of like based on other characters in any case, and the contrast between MKR and everything else you see is MKR's artwork. Original, I'm not entirely sure, I would say, but this is Chris. And just the contrast is like night and day. And the, this 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 is the big one. TSSF Sonichu Deck pre-sale, $67 to $815. What exactly do you get with all these? Bulk deal 20. If somebody genuinely bought all of this, actually, nobody would say. In fact, look at this. Card sleeves not included. You don't even get card sleeves with this. Meanwhile, let's just... I want to go through with an example where... Let's just go... I just want to give you guys a little bit of a, of a, of a different example. Let's go onto the Yu-Gi-Oh! website. And let's try a... Let's just try the uh, the Codebreaker starter deck. How much is you get? Seventy five. It's a starter deck. It's basically ten dollars per box, and you get a lot of this. You get a game mat. You get a beginner's guide. You get forty commons. You get three ultra and two super rares. So you get forty five cards in this in this deck, and you get 
for just literally less than ten dollars. Yeah, and let's just let's just go one further. Let's go into the uh, some of the tins you can actually get. You don't even get really tins for this. But let's just go for the uh, you get you get tw it's twenty dollars per tin, and you get in total three bigger than ever mega packs. You get. I don't quite know how many of these, but mostly because these are like uh, collect collector's editions, and these two things are usually quite quite rare. But if you wanted like uh, something a little bit better, if you wanted something a little bit something that it's it's a little bit more cone to, if you want to like play professionally, for example, let's just go to uh, starter decks, uh, structure decks. You could go on to uh, plenty of other things. I'm trying to like think find what the most expensive ones here. But then again, you can literally just buy these extension packs, which some of these decks are nearly over 10 years old. I mean, the uh, the Sacred Beasts, I first I think first came out. I mean, obviously, this is like a reissue of them, but I'm pretty sure these, these guys didn't come out until at least like 2005, 2006. And it's $10 for this. You could buy pretty much vintage Yu-Gi-Oh! GX cards for something this, for, for pretty much a collector's edition. That's, in fact, when you really think about it, almost all of these decks you're going to be seeing right here are almost like collector's editions in some way. Uh, but that's just... I mean, another thing as well. The uh, Yukimoto and uh, the uh, Seto Kaiba structure deck. $10 per box. Now, I don't particularly know whether or not you're getting both of these or whether you can only just get one. Each structure deck contains all of these. Pick a side. Okay, so it's just either 10 for one or the other. But that's still, again, <sighs> considering this is like, a, a, considering how Yu-Gi-Oh! is a very uh, popular uh, card game anyway, it's not particularly very difficult to work out that these sort of things are going to like gain popularity in any case. Not like this. 800. Let's just, let's just do the maths on this. You could buy over 800 Yu-Gi-Oh decks Technically 801 decks for that sort of money or 400 of those uh, sarcophagus tins Exactly you, you it's it's not hard to work out what more value you're getting out of Commissioning in December 2015 the singularity happened on Etsy, Chris offered to create a personalized video message for anyone who paid him $50. Many of his fans took him on the offer. I don't I don't I don't think that's a good idea. Thinking they could become a part of Christry by simply handing their money over to him. He received four sales within the first three days. Although those customers opted for their videos to be unlisted. A few people also chose public videos for their birthday shoutouts. After losing his Etsy shop, Chris continued offering video requests through text messages. The videos Chris delivers are characterized by laziness. He has often been late on delivering, missing. Let's just, we're going to go on to uh, YouTube again, just because I want to show you the extent of some of these. Some of these things are like outrageously dull. So, uh, paid video requests. Let's let's uh, find some of these. Uh, help, please. Sick. This is this is one of the, some of these range from twenty five seconds to nearly five minutes to again. This is you're paying money for this many seconds for for thirteen seconds, and this is what Chris actually has to say. For 13 seconds. Somebody paid him money to talk like this in 13 seconds. Hello, Ferris and Pepper. I'm sorry for the delay on uh, greening y'all and missing that in the, in the original video. But here it is. Hi, hey, Ferris. Hi, Pepper. Have a good day. 13 seconds, guys. 13 seconds. Does it seem worth it? What do you think, guys? I I, I don't need for you guys to tell me to answer that. I think we all know that it's not worth the idea. Sloppiness. Chris chooses not to edit his uh, takes or look presentable. He also delivered a video featuring an upskirt shot of his maxi pad. Profound, isn't it? Explicitly stating that the content is boring in many videos, 
Chris has mentioned his low opinion on his customers, saying things like, eh, whatever, and wow, that's just, that's just, I feel it, it's weird, whatever, while rolling his eyes. Filling up paid content with uh, drivel or off-topic rambling, despite the fact that his videos are advertised as around a minute in length on average, but can be longer in time length. In spite of these issues, he is a continuing stream of customers. A Kiwi, far a Kiwi Farms user named uh, Vanilla Code summed up the mindset of the lot with his review of the $50 paid video he ordered from Chris, which consisted of him being late. Babbling to fill up time, failing to spell the recipient's name correctly, and delivering a video 39 seconds long out of the minimum one minute. In fact, this might have actually been the one, because let's think, uh, 12 seconds, 30 seconds. It's a bit shorter than I think, but it, it could be one of those videos in any case. To be honest, I got what I expected out of the video, and money well spent in my opinion. Was it though? Chris joined Patreon on the 30th of November 2016 as a response to pressure from the financial crisis. He initially set it up to beg for money claiming that he would produce more Sonichu comics if his fans paid off his mortgage and bills. He was met with low support levels, genuinely below $40 per month. This suddenly changed around June 2017, picking up momentum from resuming the Sonichu comic of his own volition. In May, he revamped his Patreon to offer more reasonable support tiers for fans, he has enjoyed a significant uptick in supporters uh, due to his continued work on the comic, earning around $500 to $600 per month. Well, you say that, but let's just, uh... Let's just, uh... I think it's like CWC I've got to look for. Let's see what we've got. Uh, Christian Western Chandler creating art. Uh, it's probably not this one. That was probably just like... Uh, uh, here, oh, here it is. Christian Western Chandler. This is how much he is making now. $229 per month. 13 patrons, which this is actually a little bit more than what he was making the last time I checked. Last time it was something like about $150 he was making, so he's making $80 more for what is a very, very interesting thing because. Let me just. I want to show you guys something else as well. Let's see. Uh, let's just. Let's just take. I want to show you guys something as well. Uh. Begging counter. 23 days since Chris last begged for money. 216 days since he last uploaded or met his paid obligations. And this many days is when he last lost for a look for a job. Just to be clear, guys, 216 days, nobody in their right mind would hang about because it, it does seem like I'm going to I'm not gonna say necessarily, but this one hundred percent this Patreon, if when, when you look at it through me, when you look at it in my eyes, when you consider no perks, but be very careful, uh, you don't actually earn anything until you get to the $10 t donation. But then again, he doesn't offer anything anyway, so I would actually call this a scam. So yeah, I'm going to make a case right now. Is Christine's Patreon technically called a scam? And just so we're also clear right now, take a look at this. This day in Christry. Today in Christry in 2006, Christian wants to meet Megan in the park, but she doesn't show up. He talks with the ducks instead. Uh, t he revamped his pay. Let's see. Uh, uh, he initially set up for begging videos that would produce more solitude comics if his fans paid off his mortgage and bills. He was met with low support levels, generally b below $40 per month. This suddenly changed around June 2017, picking up momentum from resuming the Sonichu comic of his own volition in May. He revamped his Patreon to offer more reasonable support tiers for fans. 
he has enjoyed a significant uptick in support due to his continued work on the comic, earning around $500 to $600 per month. As his interest in his own comic has abated, and new pages more rarely released, Patreon support has shriveled to about a third of its peak, reforming his MACA awards by distinguishing different tiers for every dollar level given have not improved his steady decline in support. Miscellaneous Affairs In May 2016, Chris displayed a level of financial ignorance that shatters any hope of him ever becoming competent with money. We did an entire article about this, so uh, you could just check that out if you want like a, a further detailed uh, explanation there. Days after begging for donations to assist his ailing household, he announced that he would be starting his own business, with the declaration that each employee's salary would be 25% of the profit. Naturally, Chris completely fails to realize that under these conditions, he would have no money at all if he had four or more employees. However, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Days later, he uploaded a video attempting to go into business with Sega to create official Sonic U products. In the video, he demands a six-figure salary, along with full insurance benefits and maternity leave. These incidents seem to indicate Chris's belief that money comes out of nowhere and is in lim unlimited in value. Three years later, in April 2019, Sonichu Entertainment of America was noted by Google Maps, prompting Chris to land lord his company as legitimate in a video, though it would see no further activity. On the 24th of November 2016, Chris asked his audience to watch a clip of him playing Skylanders by uploading CWC vs Chaos in order to promote the idea of selling his in-game figure to them using the game's Skylanders creation app. He would charge $20 extra for his autograph. He also said, I am not sharing my creation app chirp, since this would allow people to order directly from Skylanders and cut off Chris's goal of profiting from his self-image. Which I'm pretty sure is illegal in any case, also nobody would ever have done this. On the 12th of January 2017, Chris uploaded Skylanders Imaginatera, Imaginate, Imaginators leader Christine W. Chander, random reviews and stuff, as an hour-half advertisement video, showing off multiple Skylanders products he had ordered, a $15 card, a $30 t-shirt, and a $50 3D doll. All embl emblazoned uh, with his avatar image, totaling at least $90. Chris's largest business failure to date followed soon after. Various Skylanders avatar products and a Sonchu figure were announced as prizes for a raffle where Chris conceived to push sales of his stamps. Slated to run from the 27th of March through 31st of April 2017, the cost of entry was buying one of Bob's stamps or Chris's stamp album on eBay, with a limit on one entry per buyer. Initially, Chris announced that the winner would receive a Sonshu figure and a Skylanders figure, and 15 runners-up would each receive a Skylanders card. A week later, he added more prizes to the mix, Skylanders t-shirts. Chris, Chris seemed to be banking on the $1,000 album selling, as it was the only scenario in which he could have shown a profit from the raffle. He promised an automatic win of a set of all three prizes. His expenditure for the raffle prizes totaled $840. No one bought the album, and less than 15 people participated in the album, although a mass buyer had purchased 18 stamps. He was left with a negative profit of $674 and 24 cents. Jesus Christ. Also, again, if Hasbro ever saw this, I would 100% expect Chris to get sued. No, it's, there's, there's just no way you could do that. Abortive Ventures. In November 2015, Chris announced that he would be setting up a shop on Zazzle.com, 
He mentioned it again half a year later, in June 2016. No progress was made, and to this day Chris has never opened a Zazzle shop. Why he dragged his feet uh, so much is unknown. Zazzle takes care of manufacturing and shipping, and there are no startup costs. All he would need to, all he would have to do is take some solitude drawings and upload them. In October 2017, amid being the subject of interviews by uh, Mary Wever Weathery, Samuchu, and uh, Copper Cab, Chris announced that he was open to being a guest on more interviews for payment. Although he didn't specify his going rate, <coughs> sorry about that, guys. Mary Weathery mentioned that Chris had asked him for $200. He has since given interviews for free taking the bend out of his potential scheme. <laughs> Financial enablers, I think we've already done that, but uh, we, can, we can get through that in, a, in another interview. Uh, ad revenue, when he was uploading his Sonichu comic pages to the Quikipedia in 2009, the thought of monetizing his webcomic didn't cross his mind. People were being annoying, nay harassing him with advertising he didn't approve of. Yet when he attempted to replace these uh, these offensive ads with his own, he simply put some random advertisements on his webpage without actually signing any sort of advertisement contract. The ads didn't make him any money. There are several advertising programs that allow individual people to put ads on their personal pages and make money out of them. Some of these programs are even specifically geared toward webcomic artists. Many webcomics have a donation box where readers can donate money to the artist via PayPal or similar services. In 2016, Chris monetized his YouTube channel and added a support button, ostensibly to accept donations for Sonichu projects. Even though he didn't want to work on that, and for a year, YouTube simply became another place from which he could beg for money. It took a while for Chris to try drawing on camera in live streams, in live drawing streams, and even then he hasn't demonstrated it too often and has done an extremely poor job of it. He simply sits in front of his PS4 camera, which is hard coded to only record in flipped mirror mode, and is positioned so that viewers see an upside down video set at a dizzying angle. Uh, I think actually we could uh, just do that very, very quickly. Let me just uh, go back to his channel. Uh, it shouldn't be a... Uh, it's got to be... I think it's like one of these, but I think like the drawing videos is like... I was, I'll just let you know if I could like at least see some of it. This is, I think this is like meant to be like... It's got to be like one of these... Uh, Well, in any case, well, you, you get the idea. Let's see. Uh, and web comics that update daily usually generate review of some sort. Ads, donations, print versions, merchandise, what have you. Allowing the artists to treat their comics like a full day job. These are called self-sufficient web comics. Penny Arcade, XKCD, questionable content. Chris has thoroughly embraced the point of view that the comic shouldn't have a set schedule and inspiration doesn't have a deadline. Also, while also promising us that the comic would be updated daily, on the 14th of November 2009, Chris uh, promised that the comic would be updated daily and he managed to fulfill this promise for a while. By the end of Solitude number 10, Chris was already placing author substitutes in the story, telling people to quit whining about the lack of updates. This is obviously not a question of punctuality, but hypocrisy. Chris would avoid a lot of drama if he just admitted that there's no set schedule whatsoever after all. If one does consider this a question of punctuality, it doesn't look too good. Chris also tends to update in spurts in an attempt to make up for missed days. This can range anywhere from 3 to 20 pages at a time. Most professional web cartoonists have a buffer of guest comics so that they can avoid this sort of thing. 
but the thought of doing so has apparently never entered Chris's autistic mind. The same mindset also pervades every other aspect of his business, namely that Chris will uh, procrastinate on shipping orders. A key example is how he almost fucked up on the Sonic Totem. He received $1,500 for it, immediately wasted much of his profit on bling and failed to ship it to the buyer on time saying that he had run out of money to pay for mailing it. And only got around to having his mother scrounge up the cash to do so after the buyer filled a PayPal dispute. He also lost his Etsy shop as a direct result of his poor work ethic. See, Chris, it's all well and good for you to say that, you know, it such and such doesn't have a deadline, but when people are paying you vast sums of money for your shit... You've got to make sure it gets to them. Otherwise, this would not have happened. Who's he going to blame for that one? <coughs> Sorry about that. Pipe dreams. When do you want Nintendo and Sega to talk to me to evolve Sonic and Rosetu more realistically? Now! Chris demanding that multinational corporations takes orders from a nobody. Chris has had numerous aspirations to work in creative industries. So far, he has expressed his desire to make several official Sonic U video games and work on a real Sonic U comic for a real comic publisher. However, for reasons best known to himself, he elects not to find out how these industries actually work. Which is quite strange. One would assume that a person seeking a career in the industries would at least take some sort of effort to find out how the said industries work. Official publication. In the Sonic U Chronicles and Chris's resume, it's revealed that Chris is under the impression that his art isn't just good, but professional. Professional quality. Okay, Chris. Sure. And that he aspires to get into the comics and video game business. The resume reveals his widely varied skills with both pens and crayons and his desire to work as an artist for a professional comic company such as Archie Comics or Marvel. Creating his Sonichu comics. There is no word on whether or not he actually submitted anything to these companies or if they ever replied. Both technically. Unfortunately for Chris, the publishing industry doesn't work this way, especially not in case of original creations. In the case of an original work, the publishers expect complete works to be submitted to them, usually through an agent. An agent's job is to separate the wheat from the chaff, and find the correct publisher for the work. Taking a small percentage of the eventual profit for their reward. If the publishers take unsolicited submissions, they have to see sift through a gigantic backlog, often called slush pile, of submissions of highly varying quality most of which end up rejected multiple times before there will be a publisher right with right market in mind and the right publication scheduled to allow the publication deal to go forward. The whole process can take years in case of a single work. If comic book publishers have a salaried artist, they usually need to have a portfolio of previous work, usually work that has already been published commercially. Or if the comic house is particularly late, late lenient and most big names aren't there has to be evidence of a successful self-published high quality comic and even in this case these artists usually only work on characters and plot lines they came up from inside the house it can take time before the artist is in any position to present their own ideas for comics or use their own original characters even if he were able to stick in a company for a long time he'd still need to improve his communication skills a lot. If the Solitude Chronicles uh, PowerPoint and various phone conversations are of any indication, he's unable to persuade his superiors that uh, his ideas are worth working on. In short, Chris is deluded if he thinks that any company will just pick him up and tell him to work on the Solitude comics. Even if Chris does uh, get in, there's also the problem with scheduling. Most comics are worked. Uh, what's this? Most comics are worked on it far in advance, thus allowing for any changes concerning a book, such as plot problems, character availability changes, or even cancellations. 
Even so, many of them maintain a certain schedule, either monthly or bi-monthly, sometimes uh, quarterly. Very rarely do comics go bi-weekly, one every two weeks. Though weekly series have been more common, though infrequently. DC Comics, for example, experienced the weekly format in the 1980s with Action Comics Weekly, an anthology which bombed and put the title on, on a hiatus for a few months, returning to its normal Action Comics title and monthly format. 20 years later, DC has churned out a number of weekly series including 52, Countdown, Trinity, and more recently, the new 52, Future's End. All of those comics, by the way, 52, Countdown, Trinity, and uh, Future's End, they all suck, by the way. Those are terrible, terrible comics with... The the, the, the plot is... The plots of those comics... And, like, if, if you want a more thorough example, just go watch Linkara. He, I don't have time to go into explanations about those here now, but... This is just... You see, this is, this is the difference between Chris and reality, is that Chris says he wants to open negotiations to, you know, make money from his creations. This, well, this is the world. Chris wanted to find out how to break into the industry, and this is the industry, and it's far, far too much for Chris to handle. Especially because he can't, you know, su succeed on details right now. Chris's understanding of copyright is a chapter in itself. Uh, is absolutely perfect as well. Publishers want uh, primarily original works because securing the necessary rights to publish uh, derivative works is often difficult or impossible. Chris has even resisted attempts to educate himself in this regard. We did another article about that as well. In the 14th of August 2017, Chris uploaded a video where he updated the true and loyal fanbase on his progress on Sonic Shoe number 13 which he was renumbered as Sonic 2 12 to 9. He states that he decided to change the focus of the comic instead of being a crossover between the Sonic 2 gang and the Planet Dolan crew. It would instead be a fan fiction devoted to his pony avatar, Nightstar. Throughout the video, he mentions that not only he wants the comic to be a piece of fan fiction, but now he also wants to be canon in My Little Pony. Where he himself would voice over Nightstar. Of course, Chris doesn't seem to realise that the creators of the show can't just simply pick up his idea because, as stated earlier, it may lead to an accusation of idea theft. But again, by Hasbro. Games and merchandise. Chris could approach Sega and Nintendo and ask them to make Sonic 2 games, comics and merchandise. This plan would also be doomed to failure because no media companies want unsolicited ideas from the public. There are several reasons for this. First, it takes effort to sift through the idea piles and they can't give equal amount of thought on the countless ideas fans send them. While game companies may listen to their fans, they usually just want to know if the time is right for something they've been planning to do. For example, no doubt a big part of the reason why the newer Fire Emblem games got worldwide release was because the fans of Marth and Roy from Super Mario Bros. Melee were wondering aloud, why the hell isn't Nintendo releasing these games outside of Japan? They most certainly don't have the capability of starting a whole new game project just because someone asks. If the game companies respond by saying Chris had as he himself so elegantly put, rocks in his head, then you probably don't get a slice of their precious time for making a second impression. Simply put, Chris thinks that even the companies aren't busy with other projects, they still have to think of his grandiose ideas and those things only. Guys, I've had, in I've had insider experience to these sorts of things as well. Some of these, some of the guy, people that work in these studios are so pressed for time. They work such incredibly short deadlines because there is always new things in production and new things in development that it seems like, it seems only, it seems like an absurdity that games that are going to probably be published in, let's say, three years time from Nintendo, they would probably have been in production probably for years. No Man's Sky was first came about as far as like 
January as far as like 2013 and was released three years later. Some of these games could take years to develop. Which is a... Uh, which begs the question, how exactly do you, would you make a script for a Solitude game? Second, there is an age-old problem in a liturgist, a liturgist society. A fan writes to the company and says, I have this cool idea. The company says, thanks, but no thanks. One of the in-house writers comes up with exactly the same idea by accident and boom, you have a fan who's suing you for idea theft. And even if that lawsuit will usually go nowhere, it wastes perfectly usable time, energy and most of all money that could be used for more fruitful ventures. A famous example is British novelist Terry Pratchett, who used to post in his uh, Usernet fan group until one of the fans was convinced Terry had stolen his ideas. Therefore, most media houses will just say that they will not take any ideas from the public. The game industry is not an exception. This fact has been pointed out to Chris numerous times, and at least twice by real Nintendo representatives, as evidenced by the letters he has read in the captain's logs. Unfortunately, Chris misinterpreted all of this. How is a very strong point. I don't know how you could misinterpret that. Another thing that Chris disregards in the fact that writing games takes a lot of time and effort. In Thomas Edison's works, getting things done is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Many good ideas don't get implemented. No one is going to invest energy in developing an idea alone if they don't know if the idea can be implemented. Game companies may be willing to negotiate a deal to use their properties, such as characters, in games developed by third parties. But those proposals are usually backed up by real companies. Actual creative teams of developers and serious computer complete plans for games, if not outright working prototypes already, even in the case of uh, properties are tackled on the prototype later on. The prototypes are usually fully developed so that they can be used without these properties. If the plans fall through, example of Star Fox Adventures began as a game that was completely unrelated to the Star Fox universe, but Nintendo felt the game was better with the SF characters. Theoretically, it would be possible, though, though extraordinarily unlikely, for Sega and Nintendo to cooperate enough to make a game featuring a Sonic Pikachu hybrid named Sonichu. They would not, however, need any input from Chris or even his permission to combine characters that they own. Think about it. Of course, the idea of releasing it cross-platform for Sony consoles remains yet another absurd and fevered dream on the part of Chris. In the Sonichu Chronicles, he gives uh, Shigeru Miyamoto permission to use the cover of his hand-drawn Nintendo Power magazine as the inevitable cover f for when his game is created. Even though it's several years old, and in fact even worse than Chris's current skill at art. That is saying a lot. And that, guys, is the very end of Chris and Business. I hope everyone has enjoyed this. Like, given the fact that we, the, of the person who's making these decisions as well, is has a very notorious reputation on the internet, charges extortion-like prices... <coughs> will not develop, deliver on deadlines and resulted in the termination because of his laziness. And given the fact that we've had a pretty much a very serious insight as to why negotiations between Sega or any sort of we any uh, webcomic or comic book publishers would make it known to Chris exactly why this would never work. This, for the most part, seems to go over Chris's head, or it goes by him so much that he's still going to persist and he's still going to make an ass out of himself. This is why it's so important you have to learn. If you're going to get involved in these sort of things whatsoever, Chris, you, you can't just look at it with something like this. You've got to understand 100% what where you're going with this. You've got to understand that if you want to be taken seriously, then you've got to deliver something serious you can't just come up with any number out of your head and expect people to buy it 
it's fair to say that uh, Chris's business is, if it's not going under, it already has several times over. Kind of like a uh, Groundhog Day version of Titanic or that episode of The Sweet Life on Deck where the ship constantly got struck by lightning. That's kind of like what Chris's business is. It's doomed to fail and it will continue time and time again because of one reason and one reason only. The person leading the ship. The leading the ship straight into the friggin' iceberg. So anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this reading of Chris and Business. Please leave your thoughts and comments in the comment section down below. Let me know what you guys thought of the reading yourself. And I hope to all of you guys again in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye for now.